हरे ओ नमः there are events destined by fate and there are major events destined by providence these events for the future obviously can be foreseen by theistic transcendentalists realized individuals such as his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami prabhupad he made two prophecies for the future obviously while he was with us and this one is the main one that i'm about to quote it's the prominent one quote lord chaitanya mahaprabhu has forecast that this hari krishna mantra will be heard in every nook and cranny of the globe he is god so it will happen that is a fact so if we take advantage then we may take the credit but if we do not someone else will unquote. this is an excerpt from a letter to a prominent leading secretary in early november 1970 a version of this same excerpt practically an exact replica was also sent to two other leading secretaries in the same time period we should conceptualize that no doubt this great spiritual event will transpire it must be a clean conception however in other words what may appear to be the resultant of the prophecy must not be the product of fanaticism by true believers the holy name must be spread free from such impurities in order to be actually effective the destiny being alluded to in the prophecy is providential not faithful the holy name is not to be spread by force or institutional oppression as these are material instruments spreading the hari krishna mantra by means of an impure vehicle will neither prove effective in the long run nor will it fulfill the prophecy in point of fact such an impure vessel of propaganda will delay the spreading of krishna consciousness via the holy name to every town and village of the world when it comes to destiny there is the macro consideration and then there is also the personal micro consideration let us now discuss destiny in the context of the divine prophecy let us discuss this personal micro consideration time offers the conditioned souls both predestined happiness and misery every one is suffering and enjoying the result of his own destiny and this is known as personal fate this personal destiny is created in the course of social interaction as such everyone creates his or her own destiny under the supervision of time fate is one side of the coin of destiny and the other side is providence as per theistic philosophy providence intends not all which happens but only what is actually good ultimately in the context of the transcendental a human being has it in his or her power by his or her chosen actions to aid the intentions of providence higher destiny because providence desires only good at the time of danger we remember providence that is also good for us obviously especially when the supreme controller decides himself to protect us now prabhupada's prophecy which was repeating lord chaitanya's prophecy must be understood in this context it must be spread in that very way in which the vaishnava acharyas of the guru parampara reach practically every nook and corner of india at this time and such has been the case for hundreds of years 
However, today, certainly that's not the case throughout the rest of the world. Destiny or fate is called adrishta. Adrishta is that which cannot be seen. But that destiny has been determined by superior intelligence of the demigods, especially the higher demigods. In spiritual life, the sadhaka does not waste time striving for so-called happiness and distress because it's already destined. No conditioned soul can effectively change it. There is fateful destiny which conditioned souls cannot improve. As far as material enjoyment is concerned, Paramatma can interfere with it if he chooses to do so. He rarely does. But you can improve in Krishna consciousness. That opportunity is there on the other side of the coin of fateful destiny. That chance is providential. Naturally, we cannot violate material destiny, but our destiny can be changed by the Paramatma, by Krishna, if and or when we decide to become fully Krishna consciousness and act accordingly. Now, Krishna, the Supreme Lord, knows everyone's future. But that does not remove the Jivatma's individual free will. There are two destinies for everyone. One destiny is in Krishna consciousness. That is the micro-consideration of providence. And the other destiny is in material consciousness, fate. If someone is in Krishna consciousness, then the Paramatma certainly knows his future. However, if he or she is in material consciousness and acting in that way, then Paramatma also knows his or her future. How could it be otherwise? Lord Vishnu is omniscient. In this way, free will is not actually affected by the Parameshwaras knowing the future of the living being. Regarding free will and predestination, materially, everything is decided. Spiritually, and this is especially applicable to devotees, a human being can make advancement despite his or her material destiny. He or she can transcend material consciousness, which in most cases will improve the material condition. No conditioned soul can change things but spiritually, by higher destiny or providence, there is possibility for such a change. We find the following lengthy excerpt from a letter by Prabhupada to one of his leading secretaries dated October 21, 1975. Quote, so anyone who surrenders to Krishna, his destiny is changed by the omnipotency of God. He takes charge of the devotee and guides him how the devotee can go back home, back to Godhead. But you are thinking God is like you. What is destined is going to happen and even God cannot change it? God will save you from the destiny that you have created by misuse of your independence. He knows, but still he is so kind. Surrender has nothing to do with your destiny. That will depend upon you, the spirit soul, because you have a little independence, a little freedom. If you surrender to Krishna, there is no more predestiny." Unquote. Now, how does God come to us as impure beings? God comes to the conditioned soul, the human conditioned soul, through the medium of the physically manifest spiritual master. That is the Vedic and Vaishnav teaching, and that teaching has been extant for millennia. It will never change. Now, what about coming into contact with just such a perfected guru? in this case, namely Prabhupada. 
Was that predestined by fate or by providence? His divine grace gives us this translation from the Bhagavad to ponder. Quote, we think that we have met your goodness, capitalized, by the will of providence, capitalized, just so that we may accept you as captain of the ship for those who desire to cross the difficult ocean of Kali, which deteriorates all the good qualities of a human being." Unquote. Why unnecessarily cavil about the word quote-unquote meeting here? Although its obvious meaning is related to contact on the physical platform, and the sages did meet Shukadeva in that way, it also includes coming into contact with Prabhupada via his teachings in the form of commentary on Vaishnava literature. How could it be otherwise? Through his writings and teachings, let us stipulate that there are many ways in which first contact with Prabhupada can be made. You may contact him via one of his books on a shelf in your local library. It's possible. Or you may contact his writings in a standalone article on the internet. There are independent articles and or books which feature or discuss Prabhupada at least to a significant extent. These are, these independent ones, unaffiliated with any particular devotee or group of devotees. Of course, they are part of the minority report. You may contact him via a website which claims a direct link to him. Some of these websites do not feature him primarily or they do not even discuss him all that much. Others, however, do highlight him. There are many such websites. Also on the internet, the World Wide Web, there is at least one daily newspaper or newsletter, if you'd like to call it that, featuring articles and editorials that present a smorgasbord of views in which Prabhupada is often discussed in those articles. The last time I read anything on that rag was over a decade ago, and by now I presume there's probably more than one of them online. They don't interest me, obviously. Then we come to the possibility of contacting Prabhupada via a group. Perhaps today is your first contact. For example, you might first come into contact with His Divine Grace through the Prabhupada via this group, the Vaishnava Foundation. We've been around since the late 80s, and the Vaishnava Foundation has been part of the World Wide Web since the mid-90s. Obviously, there are other groups to consider. The most prominent one would be so-called ISKCON. It is the largest group. Although there is a major split within it between its left and right wings, superficially it maintains an effective image of unity in most cases. Or you may be proselytized to by one of its devotees out on the street or even in a laundromat. That person will not mention which camp of the split he or she is affiliated with, of course. Still, Prabhupada will be introduced to you one way or the other, particularly if you are offered and accept one of his books as part of the proselytizing effort. You may come into contact with Prabhupada via Neomat. This contact, however, will be very different from the others because Prabhupada is neither emphasized nor highlighted whatsoever in Neomat. There are many reasons for this but to discuss any of them would be going off on a tangent. Nevertheless, we have pointed out repeatedly in previous articles and video presentations, Neomat is Gaudiya Mutt 2.0. While Prabhupada was active in Gaudiya Mutt in India, he was somewhat covertly disrespected by that institution. However, that's a long story, so we're not going to get into it here. Nevertheless, if you come into contact with Prabhupada for the first time via Neomat, you will find him mentioned as little more than the Diksha Guru of most of today's Neomat Gurus. 
you will hear him or read him mentioned as, in that context, as my quote-unquote Guru Maharaj. But Prabhupada's spiritual master will be mentioned and emphasized far more than his Divine Grace Prabhupada. Then again, another way in which you may first come into contact with Prabhupada could be through one of the divergent groups, cumulatively known as Ritvik. There are many of them. The thing most of those have in common, and for all practical purposes, the only thing that they have in common is the heretical belief that a non-manifest spiritual master can be your Diksha Guru via an initiation ceremony performed by one of their so-called Ritviks. Obviously, in this context, that Guru would be Prabhupada, allegedly, being the only genuine initiating spiritual master even at this time. The overall time span is now 56 years running, counting the 11 years he initiated disciples during his physical manifestation. Yet it must be admitted that most of the Ritvik cults are Prabhupada-centered, and at least one of the splinter groups even publishes a monthly magazine called Back to Prabhupada. As a side note about these Ritviks, especially if you're planning to travel to South India, one of the groups centered there does not emphasize Prabhupada, although it is a Ritvik group. Or to give it the benefit of the doubt, it emphasizes him far less than the prominent Ritvik who allegedly performs initiations there on his behalf. This fellow accepts exalted worship as such, it is a major contradiction present in that particular cult, although, admittedly, it is still possible that you could contact Prabhupada there for the first time. Besides, first contact with Prabhupada via a devotional group, a quasi-devotional group, or a pseudo-devotional group, first contact came to some of us in a completely different way. For example, your host speaker's first contact with His Divine Grace came in the form of reading about him and looking at his picture in Be Here Now by Baba Ram Das in late 1971. Is there a paradox in all of these various ways of first contacting a fully God-realized spiritual master? Let us set the stage for addressing this question via an example, which can serve as an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, but analogies are never perfect. That's why they're called analogous to what they are attempting to elucidate. And somewhat ironically, not just somewhat, ironically, the first analogy presented here is in connection to the initial implementation of the unauthorized Zonal Acharya Imposition of 1978. It was crafted by the vitiated governing body of so-called ISKCON back in the late 70s, about four months after Prabhupada left the scene. Many, if not most, of you had no direct experience of it, but your host speaker had plenty of experience of it at that time. That is an odyssey in and of itself, of course, and we shall not delve into it here. Suffice it to say that the analogy is applicable because my memory remains sharp about a key factor which constituted the zonal imposition. You see, the vitiated GBC divided the world into 11 zones. Necessarily, all of the air quotes, ISKCON temples throughout the world, fell into one of those zones. Now, as would be expected, especially at that time, well over a decade before the first emergence of the Internet, newcomers to what they presumed was a Bhukti Yoga cult first came into knowledge of Prabhupada by entering one of those temples. Not all of them, but many of them. That was the first contact. If such a newcomer received a book from a collector or a distributor, more often than not, 
the book was received in a city in which there was a temple. That distributor recommended the buyer of the book to visit his or her local temple. The person of interest would first contact Prabhupada in the book, but Prabhupada's picture would be linked to that locale in which he or she first purchased the book, especially if that person of interest visited the center. Then the inquisitive or distressed individual would visit the center and there he or she would see the picture of Prabhupada on his Vyasasan. Of course, that newcomer would see the person or picture of the zonal Acharya on his imitation Vyasasan, which more often than not would have rivaled the opulence of Prabhupada's. The issue here is what would be preached the, to this potential new devotee. Some of them obviously were preached to effectively enough that they moved into that center and joined the newly transformed, air quotes, ISKCON movement. They did not know that it was transformed, of course, but what was one of the key initial preaching points the newcomer received? What was it that this newcomer heard early on before making his or her leap of faith to join? One of these planks, and I call it the chief one, was that the quote-unquote new guru of the center, the one on the imitation Vyasasan, was meant to be this new person's initiating spiritual master. This idea was based upon the logic that since the newcomer entered this specific temple, and since not a blade of grass moves without the approval of the will of the Supreme Lord, he or she was brought to this particular center for a specific reason. And that reason was to accept the guru of that zone and that center. This was a compelling argument for many new people. And it bore fruit for the so-called gurus and their acolytes of so-called ISKCON, who used it which was all of them. Now you may ask, how does this apply to the paradox? It applies in this way. Whichever group facilitated your first contact with Prabhupada is the group to which you allegedly then owe your spiritual allegiance. Prabhupada is absolute and your contact with him via that group or that individual especially if we're referring to one of the Neomut Neo wild cards, must therefore also be considered absolute because it or he facilitated the absolute contact for you, a lost soul, with his divine grace the God realized through the Prabhupada. Is it logical? At face value it seems to be so. A version of this logic was utilized throughout so-called ISKCON in the late 70s and the early 80s in the process of recruiting newcomers to specific new gurus. Prabhupada was used in that connection. He and the whole movement was hijacked by those new gurus and their henchmen, as most of us all now realize. Nevertheless, it proved to be a very successful tactic in the short run, those newcomers were low-hanging fruit. In order to further demonstrate the bad logic intrinsic to it, let us also consider another analogy. This one's going to be an astrological analogy. One of the divisions of sidereal astrology is a compatibility analysis between two individuals who are considering a relationship and or marriage. Your host speaker is expert in calculating these comparative charts and I have done it many times. The rules for it are meticulous and specific in sidereal astrology. Over 90% of the final conclusion is based upon a comparison of the two people in terms of their individual lunar situations, both in the moon's sign 
and in the moon's constellation. On the other hand, tropical astrology, which is also known as Western astrology, calculates compatibility charts very differently. In point of fact, it would be infrequent for a sidereal or eastern compatibility chart to come to a similar conclusion with a tropical or western compatibility chart. How does the west make its comparative calculation? Well, it first considers all of the planets for each individual, including the sign of the ascendant. It then takes a planet for the male, let us say that planet's the sun, and the position of the female sun, and determines the midpoint between them. This would be the midpoint of their closest alignment. That midpoint would then become the position of the sun in a brand new compatibility chart. All of the other planets in this new chart would be determined similarly as would be the ascendant. Thus a fully stacked chart would be made and all the strengths and weaknesses, shall we call it the midpoints chart, they would all be considered. In this way, whether or not these two individuals are compatible for a successful relationship would be determined the western way by one newly created tropical chart. You may justly ask, is it logical? Sure. Does it lead to accurate results? Not in most cases. The sidereal method is the bona fide method, and it has been extant for many centuries, or if you prefer, for millennia. This Western method is a complete concoction, but superficially it appears to be logical. It appeared to many misguided newcomers to so-called ISKCON that it was logical that they should accept the new guru of the temple they visited in coming into first contact with Srila Prabhupada, the God-realized spiritual master. However, that was bad logic. And the results of such logic, particularly if they accepted an improper initiation as a result of buying into it, turned out to be negative. For some, the result was spiritually abysmal as they gave up the baby with the bathwater and were thrown back into the pouring rain of their material destiny and samsara. Tatvamasi. So I've given two examples as analogies. Let me give you one more, please. One more example, and this one only briefly. I know one such newcomer, I've been referring to newcomers here, from back in the 70s. I did not know him at that time, but I got to know him just less than a decade later. We cooperated in Krishna Conscious Preaching for many years. During those years of association, he revealed to me how he accepted his quote-unquote new guru from the cult of his first contact, and this brief anecdote demonstrates just how devastating bad logic can be for a new person unaware of the intricacies contained in Vaishnav teaching and process. Now, what was interesting about this one, he had read about Prabhupada in an article from a countercultural newspaper during his teenage days in New York City. Is that real first contact? Technically, yes. However, it can also be considered incidental. He happened to first come into prominent or powerful contact with Prabhupada in Berkeley, California, not long after Prabhupada left material manifestation. The new guru of Berkeley then was Hangsadutta. When this particular devotee first looked at the large facial portrait of Hangsadutta on his elevated seat, that new fellow had an initial negative reaction to it. He did not like what the man's face radiated. Nevertheless, this was the temple he frequented because this was the city where he lived. 
His private life was in major turmoil and he was seeking refuge in Krishna consciousness. That's the right way to seek refuge. He was a candidate for taking to Bhakti Yoga and he was also a man who could get things done. This made him a prime target and he was preached to effectively by some Prabhupada initiates. He joined and not long after that accepted initiation from Hansadutta even though there were 10 other Indian boys in so-called ISKCON he could have visited anywhere in the world. Still, he drank the Berkeley Kool-Aid. Doubtlessly, he was far from alone. No one keeps statistics on this kind of thing, but we can presume that it was common up to the ascendance of the second transformation in the mid-80s. In other words, most newcomers accepted the guru of the zone, the zonal acharya of their first contact with Prabhupada, not just most, the overwhelming majority. So enough with the analogies. Let's dig deeper into the paradox itself. You receive your first contact with Prabhupada post-1977. He left physical manifestation in mid-November 1977. This first contact comes to you via some group or some representative of, of a prominent individual, some so-called pure devotee linked to Niamat, for example. Perhaps it comes from that powerful wild card himself. Now, ask yourself this all-important question. Does that mean that since Prabhupada is absolute, your first contact with him via that medium means that that particular medium is also absolute. Does it mean that Prabhupada has come to you only in that way in order to deliver you to the spiritual world through the personality or the cult of that instrument? You are at a crossroads in your sojourn at that time or this time. Are you going to base the rest of your spiritual life on this apparently logical conclusion? His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada is our transcendental torchlight. As a precursor to fulfilling the divine prophecy we enunciated early in the video presentation, he laid down the groundwork he was the catalyst for spreading the basic knowledge of Krishna consciousness throughout the civilized world. As already mentioned, when it comes to destiny, there is the macro consideration and the micro consideration. Prabhupada is the intersection of both of these for today's devotees because he initiated individuals and not only promulgated the prophecy. He also brought to light that prophecy, and that's the macro prophecy, the macro consideration. In terms of the above mentioned paradox, what is the right perspective? Understanding what the paradox is and in essence resolving it has to go beyond a limited narrative. All the groups, and I've mentioned all of them, have their particular narratives. And all of those narratives are in opposition to all the other ones. The narrative is not the thing, but the perspective certainly is. The divine prophecy is a source of great enthusiasm and confidence. No one disputes this. No devotee disputes it. In terms of how an individual devotee came into contact with the great devotee, who enlightened and enthused him with the divine prophecy, what is the right perspective of that all-important first contact? Do we owe an obligatory gratitude to the source which brought us that first contact? Does such alleged gratitude from this perspective require us to join that group or become a devotee of that person? 
Superficially, it may seem to be so. Yet consider the following exchange from a morning walk in Los Angeles on April 19, 1973. Prabhupada, you have already committed that the life began from matter. That is past, began. Then why do you say now again, future? Then where's the beginning? Why this contradiction? If life began from matter, that is past. That is in the past. Then why do you say again future? What is the answer? Is it not contradiction? Prominent sannyasi. It misses the whole point. Prabhupada, yes. That is wholesale nonsense. Wholesale nonsense. You are expecting the fact in the future. Still you say it began from in the past. Just see the contradiction. So contradiction means childish. When discussing one of the well-known Western philosophers, Prabhupada also said that contradiction means rascal. If you believe that you are bound to allegiance to a group, which was a conduit for your first contact with him, do you not see the inherent contradiction in that idea? First of all, let us stipulate that all of these groups are anything but situated in oneness or spiritual agreement. They do not logically fall under the umbrella of oneness and diversity. They are competitors. They have no such oneness. They are all opposed to one another. The Neomut wild cards are not opposed to one another in the WVA, but they are certainly opposed to so-called ISKCON and the Ritviks. How can any of them be channeling a pure connection to the pure devotee? And remember, we are not even including the other sources of first contact touched upon earlier in this presentation. It is a major contradiction to believe that all of these groups, or any or all of the powerful personalities working inside or outside of them, are purely channeling a contact with Prabhupada via that vehicle or some individual connected to that vehicle. The fanatics in each of the opposed groups do not believe that there is any such oneness. Instead, they believe that you can only make a legitimate first contact of any real value with Prabhupada if that connection comes through their group. Further progress in the science of theistic consciousness is impeded by sentimentalism and wrong belief. Progress in spiritual science entails clear knowledge, and that means freeing oneself from contradictions, such as what has just been described in detail with the analogies. The sentimental idea that you owe some kind of allegiance to the group which first brings you into contact with Prabhupada and the divine prophecy of Lord Chaitanya brought to you by Prabhupada is mistaken knowledge. It is contradictory. It will in many cases lead to the wrong decision of going all in and throwing in with that group or becoming initiated by a bogus guru. The raw nerve paradox of first contact is resolved by reversing and upgrading the perspective Although Nehemiah only features Prabhupada very indirectly, he is still used by its wild cards in the beginning, especially when a newcomer approaches it with a strong attraction to Prabhupada. On the other hand, so-called Iskand features Prabhupada to some extent. Ritvik puts Prabhupada completely in its center, except in that South Indian center, propping him up falsely as the Diksha Guru of its inimical cults. And please note, all of them are inimical to each other. Reversing the perspective, you are herein invited to realize the reality, the deep reality. It is Lord Vishnu and Prabhupada using impure individuals or groups all of them with material ambitions and motivations in order to bring you into contact with real 
spiritual excellence. This is the right perspective. The groups and the people in them are being used, although they wrongly think that they are exploiting Prabhupada and his excellence. Are they exploiting him? Sure, but only in their own minds and in relation to those who want to be cheated. I had no obligation to meet Ram Das. I was very attracted to the picture and biography of Prabhupada when I first contacted him in the first edition of Be Here Now. Actually, I memorized his name that night and double-checked that I had successfully done so the next morning. I had no inclination or obligation to try to meet author Ram Das or his guru, Neem Karoli Baba, who is also featured with a picture and a biography, along with many other gurus in the first edition of the book. If you are linking up with higher destiny, then you will assimilate the better perspective, especially since it is the right outlook. Your obligation is only to Prabhupada. Of course, if the group or person who first brings you into contact with him is not representing a cheating arrangement, then you can consider it. Everything connected to so-called ISKCON, Niamat, and or Ritvik is spiked with cheating. We have discussed and exposed this thoroughly in many previous articles and videos. You owe none of them anything if you first come into contact with Prabhupada through the manifest facilitation that material nature is currently providing them. Let us consider the big kahuna in particular. So-called ISKCON must be seen for what it is, a runaway train. It has deviated in many ways from what it was ordered and chartered to be and become. It has, at least indirectly, spawned both Neomut and Ritvik as splinter groups due to its many deviations. None of these groups can be reformed. They are all far too down the road in order to be made pure. Of course, neither Neomut nor Ritvik was ever genuine, as both of them were deviated right from the gate. Prabhupada should not be viewed as a commodity possessed by any of them. None of them have a monopoly on the person of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. None of them is a gateway for you to enter into the higher destiny available to you via providence. None of them is or will be the vehicle to fulfill the divine prophecy of providence, which we all became aware of by the blessings of his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. On the contrary, all of these groups are engaged big time in delaying that higher manifest destiny. The universe is teleological and your personal meaning in life is also teleological. There is a reason for the cosmic manifestation. There is a reason that you have secured this rare human opportunity to be part of this limited cosmic play on the face of this lonely outpost we call Earth. Yeah, it's a bad place, but this fact, this teleological fact, should make you happy because it means that your distressful sojourn here is worthwhile as your life has eternal meaning. When Vedic literature states that there is a meaning, teleological reason for both the universe and your good self. The interpretation is twofold. Just like, as an analogy, the interstate highway yeah, on the map. It consists of many lanes. Some of those lanes are going up, some are going down. The highway itself is listed as one on the map. And the universal matrix is also one. That is why it is called a universe. However, you have an all important choice. You can travel in the direction of material enjoyment, downwards, or to employ the analogy, you can head south, 
or you can use your rare human opportunity to achieve liberation from samsara or to again employ the analogy on the map of the highway you can head north or up that is what free will is ultimately all about south is fate north is providence both directions are teleological this is a subtle point because the Parameshwar was under no obligation to provide his reprobates from the spiritual world with an opportunity to enjoy anything. We are all eternally subordinate. When we rebelled against this, he had no obligation whatsoever to provide us the opportunity of material enjoyment. He could have assigned us all to an existence of constant punishment for becoming insubordinate to him. Still, he has created the cosmic manifestation, so there is meaning to that, teleological meaning, even in terms of temporary enjoyment. When you come to Krishna consciousness, that is supposed to mean that you can unravel all of the mysteries as to why you were put here. You can, in due course of time, do so as you become more and more Brahminical. Thus, you put all of the pieces of the puzzle together and solve the riddle. However, if you make the wrong choice, then you will become jaded due to bad association with bogus gurus or bogus initiations or bogus institutions or all three of these devolutionary entities then a new kind of mystery will envelop you in the form of a kind of black magic. Entanglement in it is almost inextricable. Do you really want that? As a devotee in good association, you have come into contact with Prabhupada. See your contact with his divine grace in the right way. Process that ticket because it provides entrance back to your eternal home outside the universe. Can you help me remember how to smile? Make it somehow all seem worthwhile. How on earth did I get so jaded? Life's mystery seems so faded. I can go when no one else can go. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. So-called ISKCON, as the mothership of deviation, is ultimately more dangerous than the two splinter groups it indirectly created many decades ago, but they're still also dangerous. If your first came into contact with Prabhupada via the runaway train of so-called ISKCON, you have no obligation to join it. You have no obligation to associate with it. You have no responsibility to it at all. This presentation is meant for your edification and that realization. You should now be adequately protected from reverting to material destiny back into that pouring rain having purchased a ticket provided by contact with Prabhupada and Providence. Sadeva Samya